Now Spurgeon was a Christian statesman, theologian, preacher, writer, pastor who lived last century in England. His life spanned only 58 years and yet in that time he accomplished probably more than a dozen men together uh, might hope to achieve in a lifetime. I was absolutely staggered to discover that Spurgeon preached face to face with almost 20 million people. He was only the pastor of one church. And it was during his ministry that the great spiritual revival in London broke out in the mid-1800s. He was born in 1834 and for the first five years of his life he lived with his grandparents. Both his father and his grandfather were congregational ministers and uh, his grandfather had a profound impact on the young lad. He learned to read at a very early age and soon developed a fascination for his grandfather's theological books. He was reading privately and publicly in worship services by the time he was six. At 10, he was reading many of the great Puritan writers such as John Owen and Richard Sibbs and John Flavel and Matthew Henry. By 15, he was so deeply versed in the great doctrines of his favorite Puritan writers that he began to come under a tremendous conviction of sin and uh, began to have an agony in a longing for salvation. One Sunday morning, he was prevented by a snowstorm from getting to his own church, and so he went into a primitive Methodist chapel nearby. And a simple but not very well-educated shoemaker was the preacher that day, and he gave out the text, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. And Spurgeon recalled that in the middle of the sermon, the preacher suddenly looked at him sitting under the gallery, just fixing his eyes on me as if he knew all my heart. He said, young man, you look very miserable. Well, I did. But I'd not been accustomed to having remarks made from the pulpit on my personal appearances before. <laughs> However, it was a good blow and it struck right home. He continued, and you will always be miserable, miserable in life and miserable in death if you don't obey my text. But if you obey it now, this moment, you'll be saved. Then lifting up his hands and shouting as only a primitive Methodist could do, <laughs> young man, look to Jesus Christ. Look, look, look. You have nothing to do but look and live. Well, I saw at once the way of salvation. I know not what else he said. I, I didn't take much notice that I was so possessed with that one thought. I had been waiting to do 50 things. But when I heard the word, look, what a charming word it seemed to me. Oh, I looked until I could have almost looked my eyes away. I thought I could have sprung from my seat in which I sat and have called out with the wildest of those Methodist brethren, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. Immediately following his conversion, Spurgeon began writing and distributing gospel tracts. Remember, he's 15. I cannot be happy unless I'm doing something for God. Within months, he was visiting about 70 people each Saturday, giving them tracts and speaking to them about their souls. All that I could see but one sinner constrained to come to Jesus. At the same time, he commenced teaching Sunday school. He was so successful that he was asked to expand his efforts. He wrote, I have endeavored to speak as a dying individual to dying souls. It was in the first of his diary entries that he recorded his longing to be caught up into the service of his Lord. Make me thy faithful servant, O my God. May I honour thee in my day and generation and be consecrated forever to thy service. And to his father he wrote, How I long for the time when it may please God to make me, like you, my father, a successful preacher of the gospel. I hope you may one day rejoice should you see me, this unworthy instrument of God, preaching to others. Well, Spurgeon's prayer was answered sooner than he thought. His first sermon was to be a, to a group of village folk at Teversham near Cambridge, and the, crest, the, the request was sprung upon him one Sunday morning without warning. 
So powerful was the effect of his impromptu message that the congregation virtually demanded that he return and preach to them again as soon as possible. He was 16. Spurgeon was very soon preaching every evening and wherever he went the congregations were in awe of this young man and his remarkable speaking ability. In October of 1851, when he was just 17, he was called to be the pastor of the Water Beach Baptist Church. The congregation numbered 40 and very rapidly grew to well over 400. The crowds who came to hear the boy preacher could not be contained within the small building and the doors and windows had to be left open so that the people standing outside could hear the service and of course the sermon. During his days at Water Beach, Spurgeon manifested a gift of the Spirit for which he was to be preeminent throughout his later ministry, the gift of understanding and influencing people. He talked to men and women on the street. He visited them in their homes. He knew them and their teenagers and their children by name. He witnessed the people's manner of life. He prayed by the sick, he comforted the suffering, and he watched by the dying. I have to remind you, he's 17. Under Spurgeon's powerful preaching and his pastoral care for the people, Water Beach was virtually transformed. The town had been notorious for drunkenness and profanity among the people. There was poverty, degradation, deep misery, and a hopelessness among the people. However, a year after Spurgeon's coming, drunkenness had almost ceased. Debauchery in the case of many was dead and men and women went off to work each day with joyful hearts singing God's praises. And Spurgeon wrote, I do testify to the praise of God's grace that it pleased the Lord to work wonders in our midst. He showed the power of Jesus' name and made me a witness of that gospel which can win souls, draw reluctant hearts and mould afresh the life and conduct of sinful men and women. During the two years he was at Water Beach, he preached over 600 sermons, averaging three each Sunday in addition to four or five on the weekday evenings. In 1854, at 19 years of age, he was called for a trial period of three months to be the pastor of the new Park Street Baptist Chapel in London. Well, he ended up being their pastor for 40 years, up until his death in 1892. At his first appearance, the service was attended by some 80 to 100 people. Within a month, the 1,200 seat chapel was full for the Sunday services with the aisles packed and the people sitting in the windows and standing shoulder to shoulder in the Sunday school area. Those who flocked to hear him week by week very soon began to speak of him as a second Whitfield. And uh, those of you who have read uh, the biography, autobiography of Spurgeon will know that he, he really did um, follow very closely Whitfield's life and ministry and uh, spoke often about Whitfield. The crowds only convinced Spurgeon all the more of the need for God's anointing of the Spirit on the ministry and therefore of the urgent need for sustained prayer. He fully expected to see God answer prayer both in the individual life and in the life of the church. But he also knew that God's power was manifested in the services in proportion to as God's, people, as God's people prayed and that in such proportion also souls were being uh, brought under conviction and drawn to Christ. And he often reminded his congregation that one thing is due to every minister, namely that in private as well as in public they must all earnestly wrestle in prayer to God that their pastor may be sustained in the great work. His great knowledge of church history had convinced him that compared with what the church had known in the past and in the light of what it should expect the Spirit of God was in great measure withdrawn from England at that time and he believed that what they needed was to cry to the Lord until he reveals his face again. All we want is the Spirit of God. Dear friends, go home and pray. Give yourself no rest until God reveals himself. Do not tarry where you are. Do not be content to go on in your everlasting jog trot as you've done. Do not be content with the mere round of formalities. Awake, O Zion, awake, awake, awake. awake. 
Spurgeon's own praying proved to be a great influence upon his people. Deeply moved by the reality of his, of his intercession, many of them became ashamed of their own pretty pious words, as the biographer says. Little by little they began to learn to wrestle with God in true prayer. When someone once asked Spurgeon the secret of his success, he replied, my people pray for me. He did not mean prayer in the usual formal and unexpectant manner, but wrestling with God in a living faith that he would answer. And so before many months it was clear that the congregation was indeed awakening. The people began to pour out their hearts in the prayer meetings such as they'd never done before. And Spurgeon wrote, Now instead of the old dull prayers, every man seemed like a crusader besieging the new Jerusalem. Each one appeared determined to storm the celestial city by the might of intercession. And soon the blessing came upon us in such abundance that we had not room to receive it. And the result was that thousands were converted in the new Park Street Chapel. Numerous institutions were developed within the life of the church. Various buildings were erected and the work of the ministry literally spread worldwide. I was interested to read that there was someone here in Australia who used to put an advertisement in the newspaper each week and that the advertisement was in fact Spurgeon's sermon for that week. Years later, Spurgeon recalled these revival days at the new Park Street Chapel. Shall we ever forget Park Street? Those prayer meetings, when I felt compelled to let you go without a word from my lips, because the Spirit of God was so awfully present that we felt bowed to the dust. Well, serious overcrowding forced the congregation to move into Exeter Hall while the new Park Street Chapel was enlarged. But at Exeter Hall, the Sunday congregations grew rapidly to almost 5,000. By the time the renovations were completed, the chapel was hopelessly inadequate and the overcrowding proved to be worse than before. <laughs> the evening services were returned to Exeter Hall, but the huge overflowing crowds very soon blocked the Strand, so much so that pedestrians could not pass and all other traffic came to a standstill. With such popularity, he was in grave danger of becoming proud and overconfident in spite of his youth, however, and his inexperience, Spurgeon was aware of this peril. Oh, when I first came, became a preacher in London, my success appalled me. And the thought of the career which seemed to open up so far from elating me cast me into the lowest depths. Who was I that I should continue to lead so great a multitude? I would betake myself to my village obscurity or I'd emigrate to America and find a solitary nest in the backwoods where I might be sufficient for the things which would be demanded of me. It was just then that the curtain was rising on my life work and I dreaded what it might reveal. Spurgeon's busy round of duties hardly left him time to think about himself. Within two years of coming to New Park Street Chapel, he was speaking three times on Sundays, often three times on Mondays, twice on every other day of the week, 11 to 14 meetings a week. He wrote, souls are being saved. I have more inquiries than I can attend to. From six to seven o'clock on Monday and Thursday evenings, I spend in the vestry. I give but brief interviews then and have to send many away without being able to see them. It's quite impossible for me to be left in quiet. Already letters come in begging me to go here, there and everywhere. And unless I go to the North Pole, I can never get away from my holy labours. <laughs> His sermons were now being published and each Monday he had hurriedly to edit the manuscript in preparation for the weekly Thursday printing. By 1856, when he was 22, some of his sermons had already sold as many as 15,000 copies each. Up until the age of 19, Spurgeon had developed, uh, sorry, had, had devoted himself entirely to his study of theology and to the ministry of preaching and teaching. Shortly after coming to New Park Street Chapel, he met Susanna Thompson, a member of the congregation. Their friendship developed rapidly and quickly ripened into rich and mature love. And in August 1854, he asked her to marry him. Spurgeon's busy round of activities permitted very little time for them to be together and often there were misunderstandings when his pressing duties came between them. And there was a notable occasion when Susanna was deeply wounded by Charles' apparent indifference to, her, indifference to her and she had to come to the painful realisation that her husband-to-be was no ordinary man. 
Well, Spurgeon's arrival in London occasioned not only opposition from the press, but also violent criticism from fellow pastors and clergymen. His dramatic and powerful preaching, which touched the hearts and lives of so many of his hearers, was an indictment on the lukewarm, half-baked, superficial preaching of many of his ministerial colleagues. This was not, only, this was not the only reason, uh, I might say, why his contemporaries felt somewhat uh, intimidated and disturbed, because by the time Spurgeon came to London, he'd read an enormous amount for someone of his age, not just in theology, but in history and politics and the sciences and botany and geography and he had an encyclopedic mind. He had a mental power that enabled him to assimilate and digest and later popularize practically everything he read. He read at least half a dozen books a week and his own library numbered some 12,000 volumes. It was said that he knew the names of every one of the 5,000 in his congregation. Since he was neither college trained nor ordained in the traditional sense, the clergy viewed him with great suspicion. Most considered him to be a charlatan. He deeply disturbed the religious complacency of his day because he came on the scene with vitality and power and his preaching was with tremendous earnestness. I'd love to have heard him. Many came away from his meetings with the distinct impression that his message had been directed entirely to them personally. Sadly, many of his contemporaries were incensed by this direct and personal confrontation by the gospel as Spurgeon preached and they set about a campaign of bitter renunciation. Well, Spurgeon made no reply to any of these attacks, though of course many of them deeply distressed him. He was also violently opposed on the ground of his Calvinistic theology. Ever since he was a young child, as I've mentioned, Spurgeon had immersed himself in the writings of the Reformers and the Puritans, and these great doctrines of grace were always the mainstay of his preaching. Powerfully effective though his preaching was, many hated the substance of those sermons. And there were not many in his day who shared his doctrinal convictions, and not many today either. All this opposition only occasioned even larger crowds flocking to hear him. And so he decided to hire the huge 10,000 seat Surrey Garden Music Hall. Well, the first night was a disaster. Opponents conspired to disturb the meeting and when Spurgeon had just commenced his sermon there was the cry from the packed congregation, fire, fire. In the panic and stampede which followed, seven died and scores were injured. The shock to Spurgeon was so devastating and the events of that night so severely affected his nervous system from which he never really recovered and many feared that he would never preach again. The press blamed him for the tragedy although his thoughtful and loving elders shielded him from the full blast of their vicious attacks. But this opposition to his ministry and to him as a person taught Spurgeon to sacrifice even his reputation for the sake of Christ. And he wrote some days later, if I must lose that too, then let it go. It is the dearest thing I have, but it shall go too. If, like my master, they shall say I have, I have a devil and am mad. Spurgeon's congregation was made up of men and women of all classes, rich and poor, well-educated as well as the common people. In fact, hundreds from among the poor regularly came to hear him. He had endeared himself to them during the cholera e epidemic in the mid-1800s when he had given himself unstintingly to visiting the sick and dying with no regard to his own health nor to the danger to which he was exposing himself. These folk came to recognise him as a preacher who genuinely cared for them and so they were more than willing to hear what he had to say about their souls. Nor were his messages in some difficult or remote style, but he spoke their language and he used illustrations drawn from everyday life that everyone understood and with which all his listeners could immediately identify. Spurgeon felt very deeply the awesome responsibility of preaching to such vast congregations. He would often be so weak just prior to the service that he would collapse to his knees in the vestry, pleading for God's assistance and strength. There were times when he seemed unable to go out and stand before the people and the deacons found it necessary to come in and lift him from his knees just at the moment before the service was to commence. 
Once in the pulpit, however, he always experienced a great sense of power from on high and would pray and preach with colossal earnestness. Throughout his ministry, many remembered Spurgeon's prayers as much as they remembered his preaching. The famous American evangelist D.L. Moody was asked after a visit to London, did you hear Spurgeon preached? Ah, yes, he replied, but better still, I heard him pray. Through his sermons, not only was, were Christians fed and built up in the faith, but sinners were earnestly entreated to come to Christ there and then. Almost every sermon contained at the close a warning, a begging, a pleading for sinners to trust Christ for their salvation. Spurgeon never asked people to come forward in his meetings. He never asked for decisions or commitments. Rather, he encouraged them to go home and get alone with God in prayer, seeking him until such time as they knew they had received the gift of repentance and faith. And as a result of his consistent and powerful preaching, new members came flooding into Spurgeon's congregation, most of whom were new converts who had never attended church before. And many of these represented marvellous transformations, drunkards, harlots, thieves whose lives had changed, men and women who once did not know God, but now were happily living for the Lord and serving him. And um, Arnold Dallymore in his biography says that the blessing experienced under Spurgeon's ministry soon affected other churches. Although at first there had been a loud outcry against him, as time passed and as people read his sermons and saw his work, their opinions began to change. And by the time he'd been in London three years, some of the papers actually wrote of him quite favourably. And certain of the great literary and political figures of the nation frequently dropped into the services. Well, the rapid increase in Spurgeon's popularity necessitated the construction of a huge new church to accommodate the Sunday congregations. He determined that the building would be open debt free and the enormous expense was met by the congregation, by Spurgeon himself, and by many contributions from other sources. And so in 1861, when Spurgeon was 26, the Metropolitan Tabernacle opened its doors. It was the largest non-conformist church in the world and can hold, could hold 6,000 people. It had no pulpit as such, no organ or choir. Members of the congregation paid for their seats by monthly subscription and were admitted by ticket. <laughs> Others were allowed in five minutes before the start of each service. There were no offerings, no collection plates, and Spurgeon himself accepted no salary. The tabernacle was to be the centre of Spurgeon's ministry for the remainder of his life. It was also the centre for a bewildering number of organisations and activities which flowed out of his colossal energy, vision and leadership. By the time Spurgeon had been there 25 years, there was a staggering 66 institutions centred on the tabernacle, including over 40 missions in various parts of London, to say nothing of the many foreign missionary organisations that had sprung up as a result. Now, I found it a bit hard to work out quite how many people assisted Spurgeon, but the best I can ascertain is that in addition to his brother, who was an assistant pastor with him, he had 10 deacons and 20 elders um, to assist him, but the many organisations all required his overall direction and care. Now one of these, for which was very close to his heart, was the pastor's college. In 1854, one of his uh, enthusiastic young converts had been preaching on street corners in London and Spurgeon soon realised that he had very little grasp of biblical theology. So he arranged for him to visit one afternoon a week for theological instruction. Others soon wanted to have the same training. And so Spurgeon, when he saw the need, founded a training institution called the Pastors College, beginning with eight students uh, under the leadership of one of his ministerial colleagues. Spurgeon undertook the entire financial burden of the college, depending largely on the income from the sale of his books and sermons. The financial strain was enormous, and from time to time, he and his wife found themselves in dire straits. Nevertheless, the money kept coming, sometimes in strange and miraculous ways, and thus the college kept going and growing. Spurgeon made it clear that he was not trying to make preachers, but to help some who were already engaged in that work become better preachers. Spurgeon, of course, assisted in the lectures, and his famous volumes, The Lectures to My Students, and his all-round ministry have been of immense value to many pastors and students down to this day. 
So by 1865, the college had 93 students with another 230 in the evening classes. By the end of 1866, there were an additional 18 churches in London alone, founded by Spurgeon's students, and in addition, scores of new churches have been founded by his men in other parts of England, Scotland, and abroad. I've been absolutely staggered to read and see what went on in that metropolitan tabernacle. Quite extraordinary. He was also concerned about the many elderly widows associated with the tabernacle congregation. And so he launched the construction of what we would call home units to accommodate these folk nearby. In addition, he had a school built in which the children of his congregation could be educated. And it was not long before there were 400 students enrolled. I might add there were 1,000 students in the Sunday school and 100 teachers. It was while all this was happening that Spurgeon addressed the weekly prayer meeting of the congregation one evening in 1866 and said, Dear friends, we are a huge church and should be doing more for the Lord in this great city. I want tonight to ask him to send us some new work. And if we need money to carry it on, well, let us pray that the means also will be sent. A few days later, he received a letter from an unknown widow of a Church of England minister with the promise of 20,000 pounds. She said it was to be used for the support of orphan boys. Now, in those days, of course, that was an enormous sum of money. Spurgeon was absolutely sure that she'd made a mistake and put a couple of extra noughts on the end. <laughs> so on meeting her, he thanked her very much for the 200 pounds, <laughs> to which he replied, 200? Oh dear, I meant to write 20,000. <laughs> well, very soon the orphanage was set up and became a part of the work of the Metropolitan Tabernacle. And Dallimore says that the orphanage was a lasting demonstration of the fact that Spurgeon's faith was not mere theory, but that it produced good works. Now, the tabernacle was the centre for a large number of weekly Bible studies, all led by men and women whom Spurgeon had carefully selected and trained. I was surprised to discover that the president of the men's Bible class for 20 years was a gentleman by the name of John Dunn. <laughs> <laughs> he kept close to all these men uh, and when not available to actually be with them, carried on in a supportive and encouraging correspondence with the various leaders. In 1865, Spurgeon began publishing a monthly magazine called The Sword and the Trowel. Each issue contained, amongst other things, theological works, book reviews, news of the Lord's work from home and abroad, reports from missionaries, biographies of great Christian leaders of past generations, and so on. In that same year, he published Morning by Morning Readings, a hymn book, and the first of his seven-volume commentary on the Psalms. At the same time, he was working on numerous other books, and by the end of his life, he produced some 140 titles. Sounds familiar. <laughs> With respect to his own heavy load of responsibilities, he said on one occasion, no one living knows the toil and care I have to bear. I have to look after the orphanage. I have a char charge of the church with 400 members, 4,000 members. Sometimes there are marriages and burials to be undertaken. There's the weekly sermon to be revised, the sword and the trowel to be edited. And besides that, a weekly average of 500 letters to be answered. And so he goes on. He didn't have an Apple Mac either. <laughs> One of the most valuable enterprises which Spurgeon commenced was the Cole Porters Association. The plan was to train men to go into the remote parts of England that were unreached with the gospel and to carry with them Bible messages and tracts. It started with just two men, but rapidly grew in numbers until there were some 90 to 100 on the team. And I was amazed to read that in 1878 alone, they visited 900,000 homes. The continuing publication of Spurgeon's sermons reached extraordinary proportions even during his lifetime. But it's reckoned that uh, by 1903, which was 11 years after his death, some 300 million had been printed and it'd be impossible to estimate uh, how many to this day have actually been printed. Let me just say that uh, some years ago in, in uh, youth fellowship that I used to lead at Thorn Lee, every Sunday afternoon a group of us used to meet and we would read one of Spurgeon's sermons together. They were an enormous blessing to us and I encourage you perhaps to think of uh, something like that. 
It's generally believed that one of the factors which contributed to Spurgeon's declining health in his latter years was a major theological upheaval in which he became embroiled in the 1880s. It was known as the downgrade controversy. There were two aspects of this development. Firstly, the publication of Charles Darwin's On the Origin of the Species and The Descent of Man. These had had an enormous influence on many thinking people and there was a widespread and growing conviction that the scriptures were no longer a reliable basis for belief in our creational beginnings. Parallel with this was the growth of what was called higher criticism of the Bible. Scholars were examining the text of the scripture not with the eye of faith, nor by the aid of the spirit, but with a secular mind that questions its authorship as well as the veracity of long-held understandings and interpretations. And as a result of their pronouncements, many people felt that they could no longer adhere to the traditional views of the Bible. Does that sound up to date? We have to remember that when Spurgeon first came to London, Protestant Christianity was more or less the national religion. Sunday was strictly observed, the scriptures were respected, and apart from the untouched thousands of some of the large cities, church going was the general custom. However, churches were fashionable, respectable, and very much at peace with the world, and in general, preaching lacked unction and power. As the downgrade controversy developed, Spurgeon found himself more and more at odds with most of his contemporaries. He battled over the great historical doctrines of God's word that were being questioned and largely forsaken by the clergy and people. And eventually, with great sorrow and heartache, he withdrew from the Baptist Union as he saw his beloved denomination slide into apostasy. And it was throughout this downgrade controversy that he watched the great cardinal truths of the scriptures being replaced by a preoccupation with his exciting new scientific and scholastic discoveries. He saw that men and women were being seduced into thinking that these were now going to usher in a new age, a new age of knowledge, of industrial, social, economic and philosophical thought. But for Spurgeon, it spelled disaster for the church. He viewed all these alarming developments with deep concern. Now, in the light of the downgrade controversy, Spurgeon was one of the few men last century who actually predicted what lay ahead for the church in our day. He saw that it all ultimately hinged on man's view of scripture. The new religion, he says, sets thought above revelation and constitutes man as the supreme judge of what ought to be believed. He saw that it was not an advance of learning, but a blatant compromise with unbelief. And he could see that to doubt God's word at one point was to doubt it at every point. Sincere faith, he says, sincere faith in God must treat all of God's word alike for the faith that accepts one word of God and rejects another is not faith in God but faith in our own judgment and faith in our own taste. And he saw that ultimately no truth would be certain. Spurgeon was sure that if the slide was not checked then cat catastrophe lay ahead for the church and it was that knowledge which probably shortened his life. In his last years, he lived constantly under the burden of what he could see was going to happen. There would be a Christianity without the central doctrines and authority of the scriptures, a gospel without the offense of the cross, Christian living without the anointing of the Holy Spirit, heaven without hell, conversion without repentance. Spurgeon firmly believed without the anointing and intimacy of the Spirit of God, nothing could be accomplished. By abandoning the scriptures, the Holy Spirit was being grieved and quenched. The church would die, he said, unless there were men filled with the Holy Spirit, then the church would remain dead. And as such, Spurgeon had little sympathy for those who held to an orthodox system, but who were devoid of the living unction of the Holy Spirit. If there were only one prayer which I might pray before I died, it should be this. Lord, send thy church men filled with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Give to any denomination such men, and its progress must be mighty. Keep back such men. Send them college, gentlemen, of great refinement and profound learning, but of little fire and grace, dumb dogs which cannot bark. <laughs> and straightway that denomination must decline. Spurgeon never minced his words. <laughs> Nowhere was Spurgeon's spirit-filled life more eloquently demonstrated than in his preaching. And he dreaded the thought of ever speaking without that unction upon him. A preacher ought to know that he's really possessed by the Spirit of God. 
and that when he speaks there is an influence upon him that enables him to speak as God would have him. Otherwise, out of the pulpit he should go. He's no right to be there. He's not being called to preach. Nor did Spurgeon take lightly his responsibility for speaking the word of God accurately and earnestly. He says, it were better for me if I'd never been born than that I preach to these people carelessly or keep back any part of my master's truth. And as we've already seen, Spurgeon had soaked himself in the great doctrines of the reformers and Puritans. He didn't see these doctrines as some sort of man-made system, but he saw them as the very heart of the truth of the word of God. And he believed that sound doctrine was a fundamental necessity, not just for him as a pastor, but for all Christians, young and old. And his sermons and lectures and Bible studies were packed and jammed with good solid doctrinal material. Just try reading some of them and you'll discover that. But he preached it with such earnestness that it just took men and women by storm. He said it's a great thing to begin the Christian life by believing good solid doctrine. When people are always shifting their doctrinal principles, they're not likely to bring forth much fruit to the glory of God. And it's good for young believers to begin with a firm hold upon those great fundamental doctrines which the Lord has taught us in his word. He says, I have my own private opinion that there is no such thing as preaching Christ and him crucified unless we preach what nowadays is called Calvinism. Oh, it's a nickname to call it Calvinism, for Calvinism is the gospel and nothing else. I do not believe we can preach the gospel if we do not preach justification by faith without works, nor unless we preach the sovereignty of God in his dispensations of grace, nor unless we exalt the electing, unchangeable, eternal, immutable, conquering love of Jehovah, nor do I think we can preach the gospel unless we base it upon the special and particular redemption of his elect and chosen people, which Christ wrought out upon the cross. Nor can I comprehend a gospel which lets saints fall away after they have been called and suffers the children of God to be burned in the fire of damnation after they've once believed in Jesus. Such a gospel I abhor. Well, we could talk about Spurgeon's holiness of life. Dallymore says that he was a man of unusual holiness. The chief element of Spurgeon's entire career was his walk with God and he once said to his wife you may write my life across the sky I have nothing to conceal I was amazed to discover that Spurgeon spent most of his life in bed ill he had chronic gout and suffered terribly from it and uh, we haven't time to just read some of his letters that he wrote to his congregation during those times when he was ill. But let me just close because when Spurgeon addressed his congregation, he would always write to them and address to them, address them as those whom he loved passionately, those who, for whom his heart just longed and longed that they not only would come to Christ but that they would go on with him. And he said, the worst thing you could ever do in injuring me is to withdraw from the faith and fall away. It would break my heart. He says to his young men in the Bible studies, he says, the more I suffer, the more I cling to the gospel. It is true. And the fires only burn it into clearer certainty to my soul. I have lived on the gospel and I can die on it. Never question it. Go on to win other souls. It is the only thing worth living for. God is much glorified by conversions and therefore this should be the great object of our life. Be earnest, be prayerful, be united. Study the word, practice it. Live on Christ and live for him. And like Whitfield before him, Spurgeon was determined to wear out rather than rust out. All the way to heaven we shall only get there by the skin of our teeth. We shall not go to heaven sailing along with the sails swelling in the breeze like seabirds with their fair white wings. But we shall proceed full often with sails rent to ribbons, with masts creaking and the ship's pumps at work both night and day. <laughs> we shall reach the city at the shutting of the gate and not one hour before. Hmm. Yes, I have to finish. Let me just finish by quoting 
what he spoke to them one night about God's jealousy. He said, your God is very jealous of your love, O believer. Did he choose you? He cannot bear that you should choose another. Did he buy you in his own blood? He cannot endure that you should think that you are your own or that you should belong to this world. He loved you with a, such a love that he would not stop in heaven without you. He would sooner die than you should perish and he cannot endure that anything should stand between your heart's love and himself. He is very jealous of your trust. He will not permit you to trust in an arm of flesh. He cannot bear that you should hew out broken cisterns when the overflowing fountain is always free to you. When we lean on him, he is glad. Ah, but when we transfer our dependence to another and when we rely on our own wisdom or the wisdom of a friend or worst of all, when we trust in any works of our own, he is displeased and will chasten us that he may bring us to himself. Let this jealousy that should keep us near to Christ be also a comfort to us. For if he loves us so much as to care thus about our love, we may be sure that he will suffer nothing to harm us and will protect us from all our enemies. Or that we may have the grace this day to keep our hearts in sacred chastity for our beloved alone, with sacred jealousy shutting our eyes to all the fascinations of the world.